Travel back in time to the 80s, reliving the laughter. <laughs> the heroes. Pick up your phone and call the professionals. Go Ghostbusters. And the honesty. What's up, Norm? My nipples. It's freezing out there. <laughs> because just like you, we're stuck in the 80s. Sure, it's not 1985 right now, but who knows what tomorrow will bring. Hey, hey, welcome to Stuck in the 80s. It's your host, Spearsy. And Brad in LA. And today we turn the tables and let one of our favorite listeners interview us for a change. Alice, I'm going to ask you a couple of standard questions, okay? Don't forget, Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Podcast Network. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and the CLNS Media mobile app. It's true. So Galen DC, who is often a guest here on the show, uh, brings uh, a lot of intelligence and uh, insight to the program that Steve and I generally are lacking. Reached out to us, I don't know what, it's been maybe a couple months ago with an idea for a show. She said, hey, I think that, you know, Stuck in the 80s Nation is pretty curious about you guys. Why don't you let me interview you? And, you know, because we are both narcissists at heart, we bought into this, of course. (laughs) No, we're not narcissists. I mean, it's a good idea. I'm not going to turn down a good idea. No, it's a great idea. And it was a lot of fun. We sat down and I kind of was joking last time we talked about it. I sat down. I sat like usually I'm in kind of a office chair and I like I have my setup that I podcast in and it's pretty, pretty much business. But for that show, I like moved into the family room and I was sitting in one of my leather chairs and I had a cocktail there by me and I was all relaxed. It was kind of nice to let someone else drive. Right. Yeah. I felt like she was the designated driver and you and I had too much Jaeger. Yeah, exactly. So Gail, one other thing we ought to mention about Gail, Gail is a book blogger. Yes, we were both also surprised to find out that some of our listeners can read, uh, but she <laughs> has a book blog that's called everydayiwritethebookblog.com, and she does a lot of reviews. She reads quite a bit. I honestly don't know how, as a mom with young kids, she has that kind of time, but she does, and she's. I, I really enjoy it. She and I don't have a lot of overlap in the kind of stuff we read, but that kind of makes her interesting reviews, I find, because you get a, a look at different stuff. I like your blog because it always shows what she's reading, what she's listening to on audio, what she read this year. I mean, it's it's a great blog. It's yeah. it's, a, it's a lot better than the blog I write. Oh, come now. No, yes, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so you might wonder like, okay, so is this the first time we've ever been interviewed? Uh, n- yes and no. First time we've ever been interviewed together? Yes. Absolutely, um, yeah. I've been interviewed a couple times over the years by other podcasts and some writers. And every once in a while, when something breaks or someone dies, the media tends to reach out to me. So some of the questions that Gail asks, I've heard before, but maybe you haven't heard the answers and that's great. Yeah. And I don't think I, well, no, who would have ever interviewed me? Maybe when I was 10 for this, you know, the local paper. So what do you want for Christmas this year, little boy? (laughs) You know, but. Not beyond that. I can still remember what I want for Christmas when I was 10 years old. I never got it, but that's okay. Uh, um, <laughs> it's okay. Actually, Let it go. It's Let funny you'd say that. You it's know it. Every, you know the every, answer. You're going to tell us anyway, aren't you? No, I'm not. I'm going to talk about myself. Um, every year in December, I changed my profile picture to a picture of myself that ran in the local paper when I was in second grade in the Letters to Santa section. The one with the little glasses on, on you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the little sweater. It's adorable. Little black and white. I know. Yeah, back when I was a cute kid. Kid. You're a cute adult, if I can say so. I asked for a 1976, like the Spirit of 76 HO train set. I got it, and I still have it. Wow. That's amazing. And that's going to come up again when we talk about uh, our PPTMN Segi. But first, without any further ado, here's our interview with the Stuck in the 80s gang and Gail in D.C. Please, please tell me. So 
today we're turning the tables on the podcast and making Steve and B-Rad the topics of conversation on Stuck in the 80s. So a little bit of background on me and why I am such a fan that I'm interviewing the host of the show. I've been listening to the show for about eight years. I discovered it one day. I did a search for 80s music podcasts before going for a run and figured I'd see what came up. And sure enough, Stuck in the 80s popped up. And I listened to an episode and I was absolutely hooked from that day on. So I listened back to a number of the episodes that I'd missed and I've caught all of the new episodes ever since then. That was probably about eight years ago. So I'm an extremely loyal listener. I listen to it mostly when I run, occasionally when I'm driving, but it's usually my running podcast. So I associate it with a lot of places I've run, both here in D.C., which is where I live, and when I've been on vacation. So I feel like I've taken you guys with me as I've you know traveled the world, and it's always nice to hear familiar voices as I you know run wherever I am. And I just love the content of the show. I love the topics you cover. I'm obviously a huge fan of the 80s, otherwise I wouldn't be listening. But I really appreciate the interviews you do. I appreciate the episodes that you guys consider filler, but like those 80s news now things. I like the ones where you flash back to albums. I, there's pretty much nothing I don't like. So I've, I've really enjoyed it. I think and... we found our target demographic, Steve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, you know, I, I've i also been very fortunate that I've been able to co-host with you guys a few times, which is always a huge thrill for me and I, something I really, really look forward to and really enjoy. But like most of the listeners, I think that, you know, I have questions about the show and questions about you guys and the process and the topics you cover and everything about the show that, you know, I've never gotten answered. So I thought, why not have me interview you guys for once? So... Instead of you having to come up with the questions, I came up with the questions. And I'm going to ask a bunch of things that I want to know that I assume other 80s, uh, stuck in the 80s fans want to know as well. This is so meta. I love it. <laughs> I, 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 prep I, I love meta. Well, yeah. And I love not having to prep. I mean, this is like the win win. Can we do um, another one next week? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Every week. I'm sure. If we'll see what we, how many of these questions we actually get to. So I have a bunch of questions about you guys, about you guys, how you relate to each other, how you relate to our fans, your fans, how you relate to the 80s, the show itself. I have a little speed round for you for the end of this. So uh -oh. I'm going to ask you, fire a bunch of questions at you. Pretty, They're pretty easy. Um, so I'm just going to hop in and, and, and ask away. Yeah, let's do this thing. Sure. I'm excited. Right, good. Yeah. All right. So let's, Steve, let's start with you. Because you, of course, were there from the beginning. So there's been a lot of iterations of the show. There were, you know, whole iterations before I even started listening. So like the Gina years and the Kathy Wass era. And I think by the time I was listening, I think it was probably already Sean Daly. And now, of course, the Brad episodes as well. So why don't you just take us back to the beginning and tell us how did the show get started? Whose idea was it? I assume yours. Um, but how did, how did it get started and how did it go from idea into reality? So in nineteen, so in nineteen eighty five. No, so in two thousand five. <laughs> I don't know why. So starting off with the snafu already. So in two thousand and five, I had my twentieth high school reunion, and I didn't want to go, but I didn't want to leave them high and dry. So I volunteered to do a blog for the official website, which I also built for them. And D so wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't want to go. I haven't, heard surprise. The, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that part of the story. I knew that it was associated with your reunion, but I didn't know that it was done out of a, well, I can do this and then not go. Please yeah. continue. This is amazing. It's not really. I just, it is. I didn't, it's not really. I, I didn't have a great time at my 10 year reunion and I didn't really want to do the 20th. But at that time I was really into building websites and I was into blogging. And so I, I said, you know, I, I will, they were asking for people to join the committee and they were kind of like leaning on me because I was one of the few people still living in Tampa Bay who, you know, went to the school and yeah. boots on the ground. Right. So I built them the website and I built, and I built the blog and I started blogging about my memories of high school. And I was surprised how much engagement I was getting. People were commenting, people were like, oh my God, I totally forgot that story and this and that. And so I went to, Eventually, I decided to go to the reunion, and it was the most um, 
surreal experience of my life. I mean, I really was just like all the skeletons and all the, all the bad vibes that I got from the 10 year reunion and any issues I had from high school, they were all kind of like just wiped clean at the 20 year reunion. Nice. And I think it also happened on my birthday, which was even weirder. And when it was all over, I just felt so like, well, where do we go from here? I mean, it's like we, I put all this effort into this reunion and now it's over. And right what about do you then, mean it's pop- over. It's over. It's over, man. Go home. And uh, <laughs> right about then, podcasting was becoming a thing. And I was working for the web department of the St. Pete Times. And we were talking about podcasting. And let's let's come up with some podcast ideas. And the first idea that I thought of was like, well, I want to do something that doesn't feel like work. Like, I don't want to do a news that. podcast. Yeah, I don't want to do a news podcast or a sports podcast. And so I pitched the idea of um, doing an 80s podcast. And it was only supposed to be like a very short segment, like a five-minute segment inside of a larger podcast. And we we did the first one, Gina uh, Vivanetto and I, because I, I had done an online chat with her a year or so previously to that where she was talking about her favorite concerts when she was a kid. And she I found out she you know same age as me. So we um, we had been to a lot of the same concerts. We had a lot of the same experiences. We still had the same love of the 80s. It just became one of those obvious things, like let's do – an 80s podcast. And so Gina was with us for, it wasn't years. She was there for, uh, I <laughs> think, 25 or 30 episodes. I mean, she was definitely like one of the keys to getting it all started. And so we started it. It was obviously too long to fit inside of another podcast and it became its own podcast. But if you do look at those first 10 or 15 episodes, they're all close to being about 15 minutes long. And <laughs> that didn't last too long. So, Did you launch the blog at the same time as the podcast? No, the, the public blog. No, the the podcast came first. We did the blog secondary as a way to correct our mistakes. <laughs> oh, really? So people would, would write in and be like, yeah. "You know, that's really off of wildflowers, not on yeah. damn the torpedoes." That, that's exactly why the blog started. It was like as a, a support system for the <laughs> podcast. At the time, blogging was it had been around for maybe six or seven or eight years. It, yeah, it'd been around Five, for a while, years. but as part of the web department. I was in, in charge of all the blogs and some of these bloggers would like blog once every 10 days. And I just thought that was so lazy. Part of the idea of stuck in the eighties, as far as the blog goes, was I was going to show them that I could blog every single day about something that happened 30 years ago. And, and I did for the first seven or so years, seven or eight years of the blog. It, I blogged every single day. That's a yeah. commitment. Yeah. I mean, doing a daily blog like that is a big commitment. It, it was, but it was fun. Now, do you feel like now flash forward to 2017, podcasting is even bigger than ever and blogging, I think blogging has really taken a backseat to some of these other kind of more immediate and a little bit more interactive and certainly more um, audio or video focused platforms. Do you feel like... Like is the blog kind of a, a burden? Is it, and I know you that delegate some of it, so you're not writing every post. Is it something you enjoy keeping up or do you do it because you feel like you're obligated to either contractually or just to the fans or, you know, what, what's your, what's your view of like the future of the blog? That is a complicated answer. It, it feels like more of a burden nowadays. Um, it is something that I'm contractually obligated to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I get paid for it. Very, very, very small amount of money. <laughs> I, should, I should make that really clear. Um, but the only time I blog now really is like I'll be sitting at my desk or, you know, in front of the TV and I'll have this idea and I just need to like sort of vent it out of my head and I'll use the blog for that. So I don't, I don't blog seven days a week anymore. It's more like five days mm-hmm. a week. And with the help of, Stuck in these friends like Kevin Wench, who writes the Lost and Found piece, and Dr. Mm-hmm. Dim, who lost the Never Found piece, and then Peter Ryan in Montreal, who's really great about giving me concert reviews. So it's, it's, it is definitely a team effort now. But yeah, the blog takes a back seat. That's for sure. Right. Right. Okay. So here's a question I want to ask you guys because I ask myself this all the time. I personally, wasn't that happy in the eighties. Like that was not the happiest time of my life. It was middle school and high school and, you know, parents getting divorced and and I guess it was college too. 
And like, it's not like I look back on the eighties and think, God, I would go back there in a heartbeat. And that was amazing. But I feel just this tremendous amount of nostalgia for the decade. And it's still the music I listen to. And obviously I spent hours listening to this podcast and it's a huge thing. <laughs> for me. So given that the happiest times of my life have not been in the eighties, why do you think this decade holds such power over us from sort of a nostalgia perspective and just why the endless fascination? And I, and I granted, I have friends who probably think I'm nuts that why do I, why am I living in the past so much? But like you have a very vibrant, strong following and a lot of people out there just love the eighties. So what is it about that decade that we can't let it go? Let me, let me take a crack at that real quick. Gail, I didn't say this. This isn't my, I, I wish this was my phrase, but I do believe that the golden age of everything is when you're 15 years old. Right. And I was 15 years old in 1982. And those years, while I would agree with you, they were not, I mean, maybe because I'm happy now, I'm able to look back on those times with such fondness and see just the good things. But honestly, my life is great now. I have a very charmed life. But I, I think that because you know, you're exposed to all this stuff for the first time. It just, it gets its hooks in you in a way that stuff can't anymore. Like I was talking to my son about this, about how like I like the new U2 music for instance, but it's never going to be the unforgettable fire. I'm mm -hmm. never going to have that experience again where like an album just rocks my socks off like like the Joshua Tree. It just it's not going to happen because I'm just I'm older, I'm more jaded, I'm w whatever. I have more experience, I have more cynicism. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but that's I think what I don't know, for me anyway, that's what makes the 80s such a a touchstone, if you will. Yeah. Well, people do say that that your favorite music is the music you came of age to. Sure. I think the other point that's interesting too is that um, and Brad knows this better than anybody. The he's at that age where he not only is he nostalgic for that era, he has kids who are in that their teens, and so he, he they're old enough to understand the Breakfast Club and Saint Elmo's Fire and Journey and the Police, and so he can pass that along to them and they can appreciate it. They're at that age, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people our age have have kids who are, you know, teenagers. And that's the time you introduce them to, this is what turned me on when I was your age. It, so it's it is a weird whammy. realization. Yeah. It is a weird moment when you're like, I, I have such vibrant memories of when I was 18 years old, which my twins are, and they are 18. And it is just, it just kind of weirds me out sometimes when mm -hmm. I think about that. Like, like they are now where I was then in their lives. And, and I'm like, God, they're doing so much better than I was. Like, they're killing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like, good. What are they going to do? succeeded as a yeah. parent. Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll take some credit for it. I think Katie gets most of the credit for that. There's, there's another phenomenon, too, that's at play, which is that typically there's a nostalgia movement that's always associated with something that happened 30 years ago. When we were yeah. in the 80s, the 50s were having their big nostalgia moment. So you had Happy Days right. and Laverne and Shirley and... A lot of the '80s movies that we love are based in the the '50s and early '60s, and yeah. so that's that Back to the Future. In Peggy Sue got married. The Bomba. Exactly. So we're. But don't you think that this '80s nostalgia has been going on longer than just the 30 year mark? On yes, <laughs> I do. I appreciate every second of it. <laughs> and and we're and we're yeah. driving that bus as long as we can. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Till the it's gas tank train. is empty. Okay, so let's talk more mechanics about recording a show. Okay. So, and I've been, you know, I've seen a little bit behind the scenes just recording some episodes with you guys, but I obviously am not there for the kind of show conception and I'm not there for editing and posting and all that thing. So take us through the process from idea to it appears on iTunes. <laughs> so this kind of plays out as a series of um, Google messaging between me and Brad where I will sit here at like noon Eastern time and wait for my friend on the West coast to show up at work. So that Get we to can work, start Williams. Like, Jeez, log in. <laughs> so he, he logs in. I'm like, I'm three hours into my day. He's still blurry. Yeah. Let me, let me and say something. Steve is one of two people that I talk to every day. That's so sweet. That's, that's not within my immediate household. Steve is one of two people that I speak with every day. I love that. As a I fan, I love He's that. He's a good it's friend. Really cool. Yeah. And so we'll, 
a day or so after the show comes out, uh, the most recent show, we'll start talking about, okay, what are we going to do next? And sometimes it's, it's, it's the hardest decision we make all week because we'll sit there and go, I, nothing is popping up. Nothing is obvious. I mean, there's, it's the, it's the anniversary of nothing. You know, we yeah. just did a show about music. We can't do another one. We just did an interview. We're not going to get another one this week. Um, yeah, I'd love to tell you that we have like a three month calendar with like everything penciled uh, out for the next few months, but it's a lot more organic than that. It's one, <laughs> we're one or two weeks out at most because we want to stay nimble to some degree. We want to be able to react to the, the news. We just aren't that organized sometimes. So, well, I think um, as a fan, I th- I was going to say the fact that you don't plan out so much does make you able to react to things that happen, like Tom Petty or the George Michael episode. That was one that really stood out to me, and yeah. I, we, I like that because you guys keep it really relevant, and nothing feels stale, and nothing feels scheduled. Like, oh, you know, here's the the fourth episode of the month. We do the anniversary album episode and it it does feel more organic and much less forced oh well thanks that's good to um hear. okay so you get the idea yeah and then we'll decide do we need a co-host should we have a co-host is this something where is this a topic where like, another voice is another voice yeah right mm-hmm. do we need if we're, if we're talking about romantic movies we need another voice and it needs to be a female voice um <laughs> you know if we're ta- so we we talk about that next, and then and then the, the hard part comes because we've got to figure out how we're going to do a show where I'm three hours ahead of Brad, and we both have jobs, and and one of us has a vibrant family. The other one has a cat that likes to bite me, and <laughs> they play equally into the scheduling. We just kind of work it out from there, and so it's usually yeah. these days it's a night. It, lately, it's been a nighttime endeavor like yeah. it is tonight. We try and record on the weekends if we can a, a week ahead, but I've been traveling so much lately that we've been doing a midweek. I take my stuff into the office and go hide in a corner of my office and and podcast from there. <laughs> Nobody really mm-hmm. knows what I'm doing. Like, why do you have a <laughs> mic stand in your office, Brad? Oh, no reason. <laughs> right. Okay. So then who... Steve, I assume the answer is you edits the show. Well, it's it now it's very much 50-50. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. Brad. No, it's Okay. Brad does the first pass. So generally what happens is, so we record the podcast and uh, it's not like a live recording. Um, we back up and say, oh gosh, I'm totally screwed that up. Let's let's redo it. And, and we do as many takes as it takes to get it right. And then I clean it up, right? I take out the ums and the errs and the the all the misstarts and the you know when we're like oh wait what was that when did that come out let me look it up on google real quick on my laptop like all that stuff gets trimmed out right like that's just behind the scenes nonsense nobody cares about that and generally what i do is then i i take that uh, and then i toss it over to steve and steve does the final assembly where he puts in all the sound effects and usually he does the music cues and and whatever that may be all the transitions so that way the, the way i see it that way we have two people listening to it so both of us kind of get a pass at it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And whatever given week um, it is, sometimes when the hurricane hit Florida, obviously Brad took on the majority of the work for those couple of weeks. Um, when Brad's yeah. traveling, I'll take on more of the work. So it's, it's you know, whoever has the time. So do you guys listen to other shows, other podcasts? Oh, yeah. And what do you listen to? So I listen to This American Life. Um, I listen to The Moth. I love the storytelling angle on the moth you know how there's always kind of that joke about the hollywood people they have their like their pet project my pet project would be to start an 80s based moth clone <laughs> like to have people tell their stories about the 80s because like i have honestly it's funny just sitting here i have like two or three stories of stuff that happened to me in the 80s that i'm dying to get into the podcast that i haven't figured out an angle to tell them yet uh, let's see what else do I listen to. I listen to Men in Blazers, which is a podcast about English Premier League soccer. And <laughs> I listen to um, Planet Money, which is an NPR economics podcast, which I think is really, really good. It's it's a little wonky, but it's um, they take this cut on on news and stories just from a pure economics perspective. And I, I just I love that. I think it's really interesting. <laughs> I've listened to that before. It's really good. Oh, my yeah. God. You are such a nerd. Well, yeah. <laughs> you just figuring that out, Chuckles? No. Oh, and I also it. listen. I also listen to Two D Entertainment, which is hosted by uh, our good friend and frequent contributor, Just Drew. Yeah, that's a fantastic podcast. 
I don't have a very long commute to work, which doesn't give me, and I don't run. I barely walk. <laughs> so I don't have the time as much, but when I do listen, I listen to Mark Marin's uh, WTF podcast. He's such uh-huh. a great interviewer and I'm just in awe of him. And I wish I, he's like, he's the version of me. That's like, I think he's three years older than me. So it's, it's like looking at where my life's going to be three years from now. And it's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually him saw him that. um i saw him oh live he yeah he was at the book expo this year so you guys know i'm a book blogger and so every year i go to the book expo in new york which happens in may and it's all the hot books that are coming out you know usually through the fall a little bit into the winter and he was interviewing al franken and they both have books out oh wow and it was great. It was this, you know, it's very funny interview. Who I, I'm a big Al Franken fan, and um, and he and Mark Maron was great too. But it was just fun to see the two of them on stage and the interplay. And I picked up his book as well. So I, I think he's. I can understand why you like to listen to his show too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I kind of keep an eye on who he's interviewing, and if he's interviewing somebody I like, I will listen to the interview. But I, the, the kind of the stuff around the interview where he's just talking. I kind of skipped that stuff. So how many times have you two been in each other's physical presence? <laughs> Ooh. Um, Gee. Not that many are we times. Allowed to, are we allowed to address that? Uh, yeah, let's see. Okay, so yeah. Los Angeles to see uh, that show at the Hollywood Bowl. The first Vegas trip. First Vegas trip. Well, not, Katie I mean, came along. Your first Vegas trip, not mine. Yeah, my first, yeah, my first Vegas trip, Katie came along, and that was the, during the Daily Era. Uh, second Vegas trip, Three. and then two cruises. Only five times. Five. Well, five times. Although two of those times were for a week. So right. Not that often. Yeah, not that often. I actually would have thought it was less than that. Steve so. is my go-to case study for when people say, "Can you really make friends on the internet?" I'm like, "Yeah, you can if you listen to the right podcasts." Well, and, and Brad's my great gazoo. You know, just when I need him, he pops up. You know, hello, Fred. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when you guys are together. Steve, you, you know, you have your kind of Eeyore persona and Brad, you're very, very upbeat. And that may be a show thing because it's a nice banter and a nice sort of rhythm and, and way of differentiating personalities on the show. But does that pervade into real life as well? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the sigh. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know. What is, what, what do you think, Brad? I think yeah, pretty much. I mean, here's the thing: I don't. I, I'm I am not an actor. I'm an engineer, and I I can't put on a, a persona that isn't really kind of who I am. So yeah, I guess I am a positive person. Are you ever in a bad mood? Yeah, but not during the podcast because the podcasting is my kind of. This is a fun thing that I do for me, and yeah. it's thrilling to me that other people are willing to listen to it. Yeah, you could ask Katie. I'm in a bad mood from time to time. <laughs> uh, but I just don't – look, it just – it's not – it's usually not that big a deal. Whatever's happening, it's like it's just work. It's just a – you know, it's a system that isn't booting up. It's not – you know, you don't have terminal cancer. You, you weren't found right. by your family in cardiac arrest with no brain activity. Like things are not as bad as they could be. <laughs> That's very I, very positive I, attitude. Yeah, I'm I'm I am Eeyore in real life to some degree. It, the thing is, you never know which version of you, me you're going to get, and I think Brad knows that pretty well. It's like I I'm up and down, up and down all the time, and I don't really mind which version people catch on the show. Like if it's a down day and I'm just not feeling it, and I I I I come out with my full Eeyore. That's that's just how I am. I don't mind that so much, but yeah, Brad's uh showtime Brad and I'm a bit more of a loner. I had an ex-girlfriend one time who told me the, the most horrible thing and, and I still, it still haunts me to this day. She, um, she always said, I like the podcast version of you so much better. <laughs> oh my Ooh, gosh. That is, that's, that's not good. Yeah. So, so- that's Some, painful. Something that I, I thought about when I joined the show was I really liked the dynamic between Steve and Sean because Sean would just come at Steve, right? Like he would get angry with him. <laughs> like you got to snap out of it. And and I love that dynamic, but I can't do that dynamic because that's not that's just not the way I am. I'm like, okay, well, Steve, you know, I'm 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 going to meet him where he is. 
basically. I'm not going to try and you change. Have a very, the show has a very different feel with, with you two than it ever did with Steve and Sean. And oh, it's not yeah. like one's better than the other. It's just, they're just really different. Yeah. Just and different I, people. I'm, I'm not going to be that person because I'm not. Like I said, I'm not an actor. Right. I, can't, I can't occupy that role. Maybe the show would be more fun. I don't know. It just, it is what it is. So. No, just different. All right. So, Brad, you have lived the dream. You have <laughs> been a stuck in the 80s fan who turned into a host. Gail, you have no idea about living the dream. I am living the dream every day when I get up. When Steve was leaving the paper, he calls me up and is like, well, do you want to do you want to be the new co-host on Stuck in the 80s? I'm like, Fuck yeah, of course I do. You know, that's like in the 80s if they called and said, hey, do you want to be on Cheers as a bartender? I'm like, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was really exciting. But at the same time, it was really, I was really nervous about it. Um, are you familiar with the movie Buckaroo Banzai? I mean, I saw it in the 80s, but I don't really remember it. Okay, do you Is remember Jeff Goldblum? Jeff Goldblum, exactly. Exactly, where yeah. he, like, he shows up in like the cowboy outfit, like, this is what we're doing today, right, guys? That's kind of <laughs> how I felt. Like, I, I literally I remember sending Steve a picture of that, like, was it too soon for me to buy a microphone? Uh, so <laughs> so it was. I was really excited about it, but also really nervous. And I can't bring myself to go back and listen to those first couple shows, because I was like, oh, oh. Uh, every, hi guys <laughs> everybody's stiff for their first couple of shows i mean if you go back and listen to the first sean show he's stiff and yeah. doesn't know what to say that's just that's pretty normal the thing that actually and steve knows this the thing that got under my skin for the first year or so was we got so much mail like when's sean coming back oh and uh, you know i'm like hey like i'm the guy who's actually putting in the time here yeah. Like, you don't have to like me. That's fine. You don't want to listen to the show. That's fine. But, you know, and and I was, I guess now I'm not being the grown up about it. I was trying to be a grown up <laughs> about it and not be like, you know, your mommy doesn't love you anymore. He's not coming back. But look, this is the show we have now. So, right. uh, I, you know, that well, was, that was a little, and, and Steve was very, Steve was very gentle with me. He's like, don't worry about it, man. It's good. It's going to come around. You <laughs> Just know. pretend that today is the last day of your life. <laughs> um, no, it, the thing is that, and I, I, I've told people this privately, like if I hadn't left the times and I'd stayed there in St. Pete and I hadn't moved to Orlando, th the show would have ended probably within a month or two because Sean wasn't interested anymore. He, he was ready to move on. He was doing his TV thing. And if you listen to the last maybe 20 shows that he and I did, they were, I'm not blaming him. It's just the the pressure around us to do something else. There wasn't a lot of support at the newspaper for us to continue to do the podcast. It it was it was going to end, you know, if I'd stayed there. And so, right, you know, I'm I'm really super grateful to Brad. He's he's been a great partner for these last five years. Well, some I mean, somebody would have been happy to jump in, and I'm just glad that it was me. It was also pretty clear during the Sean years that. You know, you were you were doing the research, you were doing the work, and Sean was showing up and being Sean. I mean, that's certainly what it seemed like to the outside. And this feels a lot more like a partnership. Like when you talk about you, you do a lot more collaboration on episode topics and you both edit the show. I mean, this really truly seems like it is a effort between the two of you that you are equally invested in. Well, I'll tell you something. I will say one thing about that is I... I've learned to defer more to Steve for show ideas because my ideas are so out in the like edge case corner case world that I don't trust my own judgment on what's really an actual good topic for a show. That, that just comes from having done 400 of them. You know, you just kind of know this, this is going to work. This isn't going to work. And uh, we still try to do different stuff from time to time. You know, we've, we've been lucky in the yeah. sense that Jen with one N has, is, is now a frequent, collaborator and she has some ideas that are sometimes outside my comfort zone, but they end up working really well. So I've, I've mm -hmm. tried to open myself up more to different ideas. All right. Let's talk. Let's go back to the eighties, talk a little bit more about that decade. So I think, and we talked, we touched on this a little bit earlier. I think we've kind of moved through backlash against the eighties. Maybe that was like in the early two thousands, and I feel like we've been in a nostalgia zone for a while. And, and now we're hitting a really depressing phase, which is the deaths of a lot of our icons from that decade. Um, you know, we had 
really rough the, over the last several years with Prince and George Michael and now David Bowie and Tom Petty. And it's, I think we all are so um, affected when we hear, you know, yet another one happens. And of course, the first thing I do is I go open your Facebook page on the blog and see if you have written about it yet, make sure you know about it yet. Looking back, and we, we talked about this a little bit too, how your version of your view of the 80s has evolved through your kids or through, you know, I don't know, maybe through current events. What what would you say your own feelings about that decade have changed over time? Like, I, I mean, I can say that for me, especially with like the political world we're living in now, I do feel a lot of nostalgia for that time, even though, you know, we were living what seemed like dark political times then. It's sort of nothing compared to what we have now. <laughs> so like, how, how do you view that decade through sort of the prism of change? Well, I, I think one of the unfortunate parts, and we, I really try to avoid bringing politics into the show, and I try to avoid putting it online or expressing my feelings for, on Twitter. Um, every once in a while, if you pay really close attention, you can kind of figure out which way I'm leaning. And, and when I do bring it up, I try to bring up stuff that's like universally recognized as something that was important, like uh, Reagan's speech after the Challenger explosion or something like that. But one of the sad things today is that we're dealing with a president who, you know, had his, he became famous in the eighties. I mean, he's an eighties mm -hmm. icon. He's certainly an eighties figure if he's not an icon. And so, I mean, thankfully not a lot of people make that association like, Oh my God, you know, this is what happens when you put too much faith in the eighties, <laughs> you get Trump as a president. Thankfully nobody has said that yet. <laughs> Right. But I'm waiting for it to happen. I'm waiting for it to happen. Uh, other than that, I think that I'm more open to things now for, that happened in the 80s than I was maybe 10 or 20 years ago. I, I'm i more open to the music and the movies and the the events. I, I, w I think of them more as an observer and a um, a fan than I did back then. Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, I was a teenager in the 80s, and you know, teenagers are not known for being the most – um, secure in their worldview. And so like, you know, the stuff I like is cool and the rest of it is crap. And I think I've been able to kind of appreciate things that maybe I wasn't able to, or wasn't willing to really look very closely at in the eighties. And so as I've gotten older, at least for me, my appreciation for stuff has probably grown just because my level of acceptance has grown. Yeah. I mean, I didn't listen to rap music in the eighties, but I, I do. Exactly. But I, exactly. I kind of do sometimes now, like I'll listen to NWA or run DMC and stuff like that. And that, that birth of hip hop Google doodle a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I played with that for like two hours right. in the office. My neighbor was ready to kill me. <laughs> so, okay. Well, this is kind of a good segue to my next question, which is, if you look back now in the decade, what movies or musicians or actors do you think has had the greatest impact on our pop culture of today? Wow. Ooh. So not necessarily they were super popular back then, but you can see their influence now 30 years later. Oh, gosh. God, that's um, a particular question. Um you know, the movies that John Hughes have held up, and I think you don't hear his name as much anymore, but the, what he gave us, I think, still stands the test of time. I think bands like U2 are still as relevant today as they were 30 years ago, and I think the, the whole Joshua Tree uh, 30th anniversary reunion tour kind of shows that, that they're just as important. Can you see though traces in like current bands to the extent you may listen to them or pay attention to them? Do Wait, they, see... they still make music? <laughs> there's still there's new music being made, really? I mean, do you I wasn't aware of that. that. Do you see that? Like, has U two impacted how rock has evolved since the eighties? I mean, I think they have. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I don't listen to anything that is considered current music. I, right. I just don't. I, I just I gave up on current music. 20 years ago. 27 years yeah. ago. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I tried to embrace 90s music at the time. But when the movie The Wedding Singer came out, and it was like this love letter to the 80s, and it was like, you know, there's nothing wrong with loving the 80s. Ever, ever since then, I, I I have really kind of just written off 
mm-hmm. current music and current musicians. I mean, you have to really convince me to listen to something. Like I can't name a Coldplay song or a Radiohead song or an album or anything like that. I've never seen any of those bands in concert. I just it, okay computer. Just go with okay computer. <laughs> I don't. I just don't care. Yeah, it's, and maybe that's just you know my shtick, but it's but it is true. All right, let's talk about your fans and your relationship with your fans. So, is it weird when you meet us in person? I mean, I've never met either one of you in person, but I know you do meet fans at like the cruise, and you've had meetups in various towns, and when you've gone to concerts, you've kind of assembled a group of fans. So, is that what is it like when you meet us in person? I love it. I love the fact that somebody has spent the time and the money to come, you know, hang out with me for a day or two at a, at a concert in Vegas or, or who comes up to me at the cruise and says, you know, I've been listening to your podcast for years. I mean, I mean, I just light up inside when that happens, but there's, there's still like a bit of uncomfortableness I feel from it. And I tried, it just, man, I can't put a, a word on it. Do you just, feel like I'm, you have to live up to a certain persona or do you feel like you know, it's a line you don't necessarily want to cross? No. I, here's the thing that always gets me. And it, it got me during the first cruise where someone someone will say, oh, my God, this is Steve. He has this podcast about the 80s and he has the most unbelievable story about seeing Sting in concert where um, – <laughs> I know that the, one. They want me to tell the story. <laughs> and I'm like – I try to – it's it's been like ten years since I recorded the podcast where I told that story, and to and to some degree, when I tell the story on the podcast, I feel like I've downloaded the information into like a hard drive that anybody else can access, and I don't, I don't tell it as well ten years later as I did then. Well, they're asking feel, you to perform. Maybe that's well, it. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, here, here's the thing: when you meet people that have listened to the podcast, there's a serious information imbalance, right? they know quite a bit about mm-hmm. you just from listening to the show and you know that they listen to the show. And I, let me tell you, it is, it is absolutely humbling and absolutely flattering that people want are, are like interested in meeting me. I mean, who the f- am I? I'm just some guy <laughs> who happened to live through the age so and owns a microphone. I, well, I'll beep that out. But I, I mean, seriously, it's true. I mean, it's to me, it's still kind of amazing that someone's interested in like, Oh, you're Brad and LA. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, I actually am. But it it's, I know what Steve's saying because that's how they know you is through those stories and through that performance. And so that's kind of how they're used to interacting with you. I think that information imbalance that you mentioned is huge because we all feel this intimacy with you guys that is clearly not returned because you don't know anything about us. Well, I, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it would be great if it was. It's not well, that we you don't, don't want to know, but there's no, there's no, there's no, mechanism there's for no, it. There's no medium yeah, right. for that. Yeah, there's no medium right. for that. Right, so... If only there were blogs. All right. I mean, Brad, you and I are Facebook. Well, actually, that's all of us are Facebook friends. So you guys see some glimpse into my life. I don't know, you know, how much you pay attention or follow. That's Facebook, true. That's true. Probably your average fan, you don't know anything about them, and so we. But we feel like we spend an hour with you every week, and so we feel this like, you know, we know these backstories of your life, and we know your views on things and your tastes, and so it's it, it is this probably strange imbalance that starts that relationship off in real life it is kind of weird because and this may surprise you but i do think of myself as a pretty private person and when i started on the show i'm like well i'm not really gonna talk that much about myself because it's not about me it's about the 80s but it kind of does have to be a little bit about the host or why are you listening like you can go and look this stuff up on wikipedia just as well as i can so there has to be something to connect people to the show and i kind of realized that i needed to share a little bit more just to so that there's some connection there. Well, so where do you draw the line on what you share about your personal life on the show? Well, with me, I <sighs> kind of I, just by, by feel mm-hmm. with me. It's, I, I ask people ahead of time. Like, um, when I started the show, I was married and it's my second wife. And she specifically told me, do not mention me. Do not say my name and don't even infer that you're married on the show. Damn. Um, so for the first That's three tough. years of the sh- yeah, for the first three years of the show, I mean, I think maybe in the f- really early episodes I may have mentioned it, but she heard it and she said, "Stop it! Don't don't mention me. I don't want any stories about me or any stories about us." You know, and that was that was rough. 
throughout time, I've obviously, I mean, anyone who's listened to the show for a long period of time knows that I've dated a couple people who were fans of the show and they didn't always turn out so well. Uh, you know, Vegas girlfriend. For the record, like, Brad is trying to discourage this sort of behavior. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, do you think every- that has, do you think the fact that they didn't work out has anything to do with the fact that it started out with them being fans or just, was it just the, the virtue of that relationship? Well, that's a good question. Um, no, I don't, I don't know that think it, it helps. I don't think it helped or hurt with Vegas girlfriend. I, the problems she and I were having were not, had nothing to do with the show. There have been people I've dated who have said, don't mention me on the show. You know, you can say you have a girlfriend, but don't, don't talk about me. Don't come up with a code name for me. I don't want a nickname. And I've always honored that. Um, I went out with a girl. <laughs> oh God. And we had like, I don't know, three or four dates and it ended really awkwardly and awful. And <laughs> the one thing she said was like, you know, please, everything that happened last night, please, for the love of God, don't talk about it on your show. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I've always I've always honored that, and, and I haven't done that. I, I don't know. I guess I'd rather meet people who haven't listened to the show. But at the same time, you want to find people that are, that share your passion, right? So and that's the hard I, part. It's like yeah. if you're really into the '80s, you may have you may have heard about me by now. I'm Steve Spears. I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> I'm not. I would never say that to anybody. But no, um, I know that's why it's funny for me to say it. Yeah, Steve. yeah. I just. <laughs> It's just one of those things. Well, I mean, I'm going to still kind of figure my way around it as time goes on. On my side, Gail, like, look, my relationship with my wife is the absolutely, like, do you want to know why I'm a happy person? He do you want to know why I'm in a good world. mood all the time? Because my wife is amazing and she is so dumb. She doesn't realize what an idiot she's married <laughs> to. Like, she's she has this Brad-shaped blind spot and I just kind of slip in there and kind of stand still so she can't really see me. <laughs> but I am ultra, ultra, ultra conscious of that and I would never share anything about anything that's going on in my relationship with her that isn't something that I would post on my public Facebook page or like send in a letter to the newspaper. I just, I want to be as respectful as I can be of that relationship and that sounds, I know that sounds so corny and I'm sorry for that, but you know what? I'm not one bit sorry for that. I'm so grateful that I have that in my life and I don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. So I'm, I'm really, I try to be really thoughtful about what I say, especially about Katie. The kids are kind of fodder. I'll admit that, you know, cause they do crazy stuff cause they're kids for a while. I didn't use their names. I realized lately I've been using their names and that's fine. But, um, you know, it's, it's just about kind of keeping some separation. It doesn't bother me if people know about what I'm up to, but it shouldn't have a negative impact on my kids or my my right. wife. Okay, so you guys always lament that you don't have female fans, and I'm always like running in the <laughs> park and I'm like yelling, "You do! There are plenty of us." Shut up! I want to assure you that you do have female fans out there, and maybe the reason that we that you think you don't is because maybe we don't respond to the saggy challenges on time, like maybe which because our lives are hectic and, you, you know, I don't always listen to the show in time to send in an answer. So I just want you to know we are, we're all out there. And I, I'm wondering, what do you think outside of the obvious romantic comedies or whatever, what types of, you know, content <laughs> do you think your female fans prefer or, or like more maybe than your male fans do? Well, I, I think part of the problem has been for... <laughs> I mean, in the old days, we used to call the show a sausage hang. We didn't have the advantage of having a female co-host as often as we would have liked. Gina was there for for maybe 20 shows. Uh, Kathy was there for a few years. And we've had some guest hosts. I mean, obviously, you've been a guest host. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we have Jen with one N. So I think what females... I, I could be wrong. I've never been right in my life about what females want. But I'm really interested to hear this. They lay this one. On they me. just want their point of view on the show, and I think Jen has done a great job of that, and I think Gail's done a great job of that, of like yep. bringing in the okay. Well, here are the bands that I appreciate. Here are the movies that I like. Um, yeah. yeah, like the episodes we did with Carol, where she brought in just a banker's box full of, of research and, and background and stuff. Well, I'm always here if you want a female co-host or perspective or ideas of topics. I mean, I think there are some shows I'm like, every time Brad promises that he will never, ever, ever watch Dirty Dancing, I'm like, I'll do that show. 
I like that movie. <laughs> oh no, I'll watch it for the show, but I am prepared to hate it. Well, so, so what Gail's going to be writing it. evil notes yeah. about it the whole time because that's a big like, movie for. I mean, I I think I was in maybe a freshman in college when that came out, and that was a big movie for me and people I knew. So what Gail's doing is she's promising to carry the watermelon. I'm carrying watermelon. Uh, oh, I don't even know watch what that the movie. is. Yeah, you don't. I don't like watermelon or dirty dancing. Well, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll try and be fair. I've never seen it. How can you dislike something you're it's, not familiar with? It's not with? as bad as you think. Taste it. You might like it. It might be your new <laughs> All favorite. All right, the seggies. Are you guys sick of the seggies? Do you feel like you need to do them to fill up the show, or do you still love doing them? <laughs> I love them. I love them. I love reading the names. There. I said it. I, I love I reading the names. Them. It's my opportunity to be Don Pardo. I, I still enjoy them, and it's the best way... To get people to write us, mm-hmm. and they'll answer the seggy, and then true. they'll share a few opinions. You know, while while oh, you know, while you, while I'm at it, I I have this idea for a show, and or here's a story I have that you you, you get if we have a show with no seggies, we don't get as many emails, period, and we don't get as many stories, and we don't get the feedback. So, yep. right, are they a pain in the ass to produce? Yes, <laughs> they all are. the clips and the editing and. Yeah, and then trying to find the clip, like, oh my god, I got to find that five second clip from the poison video that I used four weeks ago. That is a pain in the butt, but the the rest of it's all good. Yeah. All right. So, do you have a dream episode or a dream guest that you haven't done yet? Hmm. Well, I came real close to getting John Cusack one time when Hot Tub Time Machine came out. Oh, so it was lined up. It was going to happen. And then they said, well, it'll be John and his co-producer. I'm like, that's fine. And then they're like, what? And then it suddenly became just the director. And I'm like, okay. Oh, right. I remember that. I remember that episode. So I I guess, you know, except for the fact that he's got such a reputation for not wanting to talk about that era, that would be my one thing. It's like, you'd want to talk to him, but you'd want him to answer the questions. And I don't think that he would. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to, I mean, this is like kind of a tropey answer, but I'd love to get like, not so much Bono, I'd like to get the edge on the show. Hmm. I want to talk to him. Like, and that's just kind of who I am because I'm I'm more, I I see myself as more the support guy that's stuck in the 80s. Like, Steve is the show. He will, he will deny this, but Steve is the show. No Steve, no show. I'm always interested in like the next level guy. Like, let's talk to Adam Clayton. Let's talk to, uh, you know, like give us your take on all this activism. Like, where are you with all this? I, that I think would be really so interesting. Steve and he- is to Bono as Brad is to no. <laughs> no, no, no. Gail, who would your dream guest be for you know either for your show or for ours? Ooh. Well, I mean, that always the answer to that is always Sting, but um. I I actually really like the TV stuff. So, and I I definitely noticed the you know the fact that there are fewer TV episodes of Stuck in the Eighties. So, maybe some of the TV stars talking about the process of you know their experiences, their memories of being on those shows. Um, maybe we can get the Hoff. <laughs> except the Hoff. That'd be interesting. <laughs> Ted Danson would be fun. Oh, Ted Danson would be great. Oh, Ted Danson. Ted Danson would be, great. Ted Danson would be amazing. Hard to get these days he's back on a hit show. Or somewhat of a hit show. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That, I actually didn't even think about my own answer to that because I'm, I love your episodes. I, I have to say um, some of the ones that I really liked early on that I listened to more than once were like the countdown shows. You did like the top 10 um, movie scores or like the top 10 depressing Phil Collins songs one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was great. Um so, I mean, a lot of the ones I really like you've done already, and I can see why, from your perspective, you don't yeah. want to revisit that stuff. You And you kind of have, you did that format for a while, and I could see why you wanted to move on from that. So, I mean, luckily, I have a library of episodes I could always go back to, but I don't know. I, I'm I'm pretty happy with, the you know, what we've got so far. I, I tell you, the, the ones that I, lo- the, actually, kind of my favorite episodes, if I had to pick ones that I really like that I've been a part of, were the first and last songs of the 80s series. I thought those were really yeah, those fun. fun. Because you really had to kind of dig through the music and kind of think about, well, it, it made me think a little bit of like, well, what makes a song an 80s song? Like, well, okay, let me set some, and then you know, you get into engineering mindset. Well, let me set some parameters here. Well, which ones meet that par- You know, that, that to me was fantastic. I had a r- great time recording those shows. All right. So before we get to my final, final question, I have a speed round for you. I have 10 questions, and I'm going to just fire them at you and just shoot off your answers. Don't even think okay. about it. 
Okay, first one. What okay. 80s album would you take with you on a desert island? Joshua Tree. Purple Rain. Okay. That's my answer too, by the way, Brad. If you oh. could have dinner tonight, well, it's late, but tomorrow night, with uh, any actor or actress from the 80s, who would it be? Molly Ringwald. Uh, Bill Murray. Okay. Okay, what... I would invite Molly's husband too, by the way. They'd both be welcome to come over. <laughs> I would make them some tri-tip. How magnanimous of you. We'd serve some nice wine. I just want to talk to her. I think she'd be really interesting to talk to. Okay, this question is two parts, or it's two questions, two separate questions. So if you could pick a year that you would return to in the 80s, just based on what was on the airwaves then, which would it be? Uh, 1984. 83. Okay. And if you had one year you would return to based on what your life was like then and you, there were things you wanted to relive, which year would it be in the 80s? Same answer, 1984. <laughs> I love that year. Um, I'm going to go with 85, but it's not because I want to relive them. It's because I want to redo them. Redo them. Interesting. Okay, so we go back to that yeah. time machine. What car did you drive in the 80s? 1982 Ford Mustang. The car that I loved in the 80s was my 1972 Triumph Spitfire. But I did not drive that all through the 80s because I sold it when we moved to, to California. Okay. So let's say you're getting on a very, very long flight and you can bring one 80s TV show with you to binge on the plane. What is it? Oh. Oh. Square pegs. That would Square be very pe short. That's like one season. <laughs> I, it's okay. You, you know what I think I would do in a 30-something only because I haven't seen it and I – and I know I would enjoy it. Okay. What do you think is the most underrated musical band or solo artist from the 80s? Ooh. The Call. Most underrated. Mm. Oh, that's a good yeah. answer. I'm going to go with The Alarm. Nice. Good answer, too. Those two bands I feel like are kind of similar. Um, yeah. What is an 80s song that you always turn off when you hear it on the radio? Anything by Culture Club. <laughs> Yeah, that's not too far from the truth. Um, put on the Ritz. Oof. Yes. Uh, and what is a song that you love from the 80s that's embarrassing to admit? Tarzan Boy. Uh, we built the city on rock and roll. <laughs> and what is the favorite episode you've ever recorded of the show? Other than this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably, either the Kenny Loggins interview or the Brian Johnson interview? I really had fun with the 10th anniversary app with the breakfast club redo. I had a really good time kind of going through my like fan fiction version of what happened to those characters. That was good. That's a good show. Okay. Last question. And I think a lot of people want to know this question. They think they want to know the answer, but it might depress them. So what is the future of this show? It, it's funny because when I first started doing it um, back in 2005 or t I don't even know if it was 2006, but my one of my bosses came to me and he, he was talking to me about the show and and he asked something like that. Like, what, what do you think the future of the show is? And I, I told him, I said, if I'm still doing this three years from now, please come and kill me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to think it's got another five years in it. I think a lot of it's just going to depend on factors that we can't really anticipate right now, like things in our personal lives. Yeah. Well, I, I, as I said earlier, no Steve, no show. So I'm at this point, I'm ready to keep doing it as long as Steve is, but we'll see. I mean, you know what? We, we got, we got plans for the rest of this year. We got plans. We have things we're talking about for next year. So it's not like it's going away. We had plans all the way through 2019. We have commitments through 2019. So all right. uh, I That's guarantee true. you will be around for another two years at least. Well, that is very reassuring to your loyal fans. Good. So, well, thank you guys for taking the time to sit down with me and answer all these questions. I found it absolutely fascinating, and I hope you're oh, it's really fun. That you're yeah, to really do. enjoyed this. Great. I, I hope it wasn't too navel gazy. I, I mean, that was the point. Please, please tell me now. And there it is, the epic uh, first ever group interview is stuck in the 80s. Brad and I, along with Gail and Deasy, I thought she did an amazing job. 
Yeah, she did really well. She also has a podcast, so she has a little practice with this kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if, if I can ask you, what question caught you most off guard? Well, I wasn't really caught off guard too much, but I hadn't really planned on getting into the whole, you know, I'm your new mom thing when I joined the show <laughs> and Sean left. <laughs> because a lot of people, honestly, for the first year, there was a lot of mail that was like, so when's he coming back? And I'm like, hey, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> I'm here now. It's, it's hard not to take that a little personally. No, it, I felt really super bad for you that year because it, it it did come in and it was time for a transition. Yeah, it, I mean it was, it's, a, it's okay. I mean it's it's not like I'm ever going to try and be Sean. I'm not because that's not who yeah. I am. And I talk about that in the interview. But it just was it was a little tough, and it's not something I like to talk about just because it's like just be the bigger person. And I'm like, yeah, screw that. It's, it's been five years. <laughs> One of the things I keep going back and forth on, and we touch on it in the podcast and in the interview, is you know bringing up my personal relationships during the show, yeah, and whether or not I regret doing it or or <laughs> most of the time, yeah, I do. I, I regret doing it because I mean, let's face it, I'm single now as 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 it stands as you listen to the show. So mainly, bringing up my personal relationship has has only burned me over the years. I believe that you are understanding orders from me to never ever mention a girlfriend again on the show. Yes, that's that's pretty much right. Yes, there there, there might we have, have been actually never in there, but yes, that's basically the gist of it. I, I know for a fact that we have actually recorded bits, and you said, "Look, I know you said all this stuff, but I'm gonna delete it. <laughs> I'm taking that out. Sometimes I just do it, but yeah." You know. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. That's fine. I mean, it really yeah. has been like it's a double edged sword. Sword, sword, the sword. Yeah, I'm so. By the time you listen to this podcast, I'll, I will be in um, Putacana for the eighties in the sand. One of the <laughs> he'll be taking applications for people to rub oil on his shoulders. Right. I'll be. I'll be like. I'll be taking further notes on how I will not talk about my personal relationships on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but but there's a participation question that I'm really happy about during the trivia sessions. Oh yeah, and it might pop up again on a future like '80s cruise or something. Oh just, wow! It's the whole um, come up to the stage, grab this inflatable sword, sword, and say the magical words that He Man says. You know when he evokes the. Uh, the sort of power. I'll be interested to see, like, does anyone actually know those words and is brave enough to come up and grasp my inflatable sword? Oh my lord! Why I'm pronouncing we're, the we're w. so far off the rails right now? <laughs> I should really stop pronouncing the W. That's all I can say. It occurs to me that we probably should have told listeners if this is your first podcast to skip back a couple and not listen to this one first. <laughs> do not, do not listen to this one first. Too late. You know, you should listen to the, the seconds. I haven't heard this theme song in forever. That's uh, Please Please Tell Me Now. Uh, this is the segue when we invite a friend of the podcast or email us in and ask, 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 ask us how to pronounce the word sword. Or if not, ask us, ask us a question about uh, our lives or whatever. I had to actually go and look and see if we still had the jingle for this. It's been so long. We do. We do. And, uh, and I'm saying everything twice again, which really bothered me in the last show, and I'm still doing it. I'm still doing, doing it. it doing it <laughs> brad take it away so ryan the pirate king dropped us a really lengthy note he says i'm curious do you all have a prized piece of 80s memorabilia that's it yep pptmn spearsy do you have a prized piece of 80s memorabilia <sighs> okay it's y yes back on october 22nd 1981 i went to my first ever concert which we've talked about on the podcast before. It was Journey on the Escape Tour with Lover Boy opening up. And I bought the concert shirt, which I'm sure at that time cost me maybe $9. Yeah. And it was the jersey kind. So it's like the heather gray front with the maroon sleeves with the Escape logo on the front. And on the back, it had the full listing of concert dates, including October 22nd in Lakeland, Florida. Now, I do not have the original anymore, but but somewhere like in the early, early, early days of Stuck in the 80s, 
I was able to find like a replica jersey of it. I mean, I mean, okay, down uh-huh. down to the like, like the, the baseball shirt one. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a picture of you in it. Yeah, it's the exact replica. If you look on the back, it has the dates and everything. Which you know, sometimes they'll have a oh, okay, it's an Ario Speedwagon, right? You've got the, the cover. Back, right, yeah, but on yeah. the back, it's not really the same thing. This is an exact replica, and I do still own that. It does not no longer fit, <laughs> but I will never get rid of it. I no. will stuff it and turn it into a pillow if I have to. So but go along with prob- your Jack Daniels pillow. It's well, yeah. I wish I still had that too. The, the, the sad thing is, and and the the point I'm trying to make here is, I, I was short sighted at one point, and I got rid of all my. 80s stuff at some point, probably during mm. the 90s. Yeah, just it's, clearing it's, stuff out. Well, yeah, it's like, oh, I gotta live light. Yeah. But I, I've been trying to like make up for it. The journey shirt will never ever go. You can bury me in it. Okay, we'll do that up in the meadow next to where I'm <laughs> being scattered. Yeah. So, what's yours? So, mine is a Devo poster, believe it or not. A signed yeah, Devo poster. Shocking. So, in 1988, Devo had a new album out and they did some in stores around LA and my buddy Greg and I went to see them at tower records in Westwood. And I took my Devo poster. It's the one that uh, Damone has on his wall in fast yeah, times. It's great. And uh, I got everybody in the band to sign it. They were doing signings, everybody in the band to sign it. And I still have it. If, actually, if you go to my Facebook page, it's my cover picture right now. It's also my cover picture on my Twitter feed. Brad in the 80s. Uh, follow <laughs> me. It's about as boring as you can imagine. Uh, mainly, I just retweet Steve stuff. But uh, the thing that's interesting about it is the in 88 for Total Devo, the original drummer, Alan Myers, had left the band and David Kendrick from Sparks had come in. So he signed where Alan is, but he drew, he drew a little skull and crossbones on <laughs> his arm, <laughs> which is kind of funny and also kind of sad because yeah. Yeah. Alan was the first one to die. Oh. Okay. So I think about hashtag, that every time I look at his poster. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag foreshadowing. David Kendrick didn't sign it. He just drew the skull and crossbones on the drummer's arm. That's not cool. And uh, I mean, at, at the time I thought it was hilarious and it was actually kind of a nice touch because why would he sign it? He's not on the poster. Yeah. You have to be a good sport though. Just sign it somewhere off yeah. in the margin. Anyway, that's cool. Did I tell you I found a video of this in store on YouTube? What? There is a picture of my friend taking a picture of this poster with two guys of Devo holding it up on YouTube. I'm, it blew my f-ing mind. That's so meta. It's just yeah. amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh. And there's this super skinny twig dude version of me standing next to my friend Greg. I'm like, who? I'm like, oh my God, that's me. Holy shit. Give that kid a sandwich. <laughs> That's amazing, but let's face it. You're still skinny now. Well, I was skinnier yeah. then, but then a gust of wind no. would have taken me away. <laughs> hey, anyway, if you have a prized piece of 80s memorabilia, tell us about it. Email us at podcast at sit80s.com. If you have a photo of it, even if it's a new photo, send it to us. We'll share it on social. We would love yeah. to see it. We would really want to, enjoy want to hear it. the stories. We want do to hear want to stories. hear the stories. Yeah. No one can top Brad for his story, or can you? Hmm. Challenge accepted. In the meantime, thanks to Gail and DC for an amazing interview. We really enjoyed our time and look forward to having her on the show very soon again. But until then, Brad and I remain here, hopelessly stuck in the 80s. Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Media Network. Special thanks to Check Battery Daily for our theme music. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or the CLNS Media mobile app. I do have an inflatable sword in the next room. That's good. That's, That's good to know.